Hi, last time we talked about the future of our planet. Today I want to develop this topic. Therefore, let's analyze the mysterious future of our solar system. Where will it be comfortable to live in a billion years and why will the Sun swallow our Earth twice? I hope you watched the previous video. If not, I will tell you briefly. It is usually thought that our Earth has quite a long time to live, until the Sun swallows us in 7.5 billion years. Although, in fact, in half a billion years life on Earth will be impossible. Due to the increase in temperature, the amount of carbon dioxide will decrease, the plants will die and there will be no oxygen either. But let's say humanity survived and became quite developed in whatever form it was. We are still just uh, fantasizing. So I generally think that uh, humanity will not live uh, that long. Even if we take the optimistic option, when we do not destroy ourselves, we will at least uh, turn into another species just evolutionarily. But again, people can only fantasize about the current moment. Until we get something qualitatively new, we will think only with the, the help of the old. So, what options do we have uh, further in the solar system? What to do after the death of the Earth? Move to other planets of the solar system? In the perspective of this half a billion years, it probably makes no sense, because it's easier to terraform our planet than another one. Even now, in an attempt to overcome global warming, people are coming up with uh, interesting projects. For example, pollute the Earth even more. Such a slightly counterintuitive thing. It is known that during volcanic eruptions ash blocks sunlight and reduces the temperature of our planet. By the same principle we know that there is not only global warming, but also global dimming. When burning different fuels, particles are formed that also block the light. The only problem is that they then settle down and make our planet darker, reducing reflectivity, and that means heating our planet again. But you can choose the right aerosol, uh, which will dissolve itself and will not make the planet darker. Then, by spraying it, you can cool the planet quite effectively. This is still being studied in the laboratory or in small areas, but nevertheless, such an aerosol will not even be particularly visible in the sky. Although, it is quite possible to use quite visible things, for example, to increase the number and reflectivity of clouds. The fact is that clouds, grouping of water vapor, are created for a reason. Water needs uh, something dense to condense. It doesn't rain in your apartment, but for example the windows fog up. It's the same here. There are various solid microparticles in the air, which serve as such nuclei on which water begins to condense. This is how clouds are created. Now you can guess. There are fewer clouds over the oceans. It's more difficult for any solid particles to appear in the air there. By the way, this is clearly visible on satellite images. Where ships go and emit these uh, particles with exhaust, clouds begin to form, in the form of lines along their road. So, if you spray something harmless in places where clouds form over the oceans, for example sea salt, then you can make clouds and reduce the temperature of the planet. As a last resort, you can make large mirrors in space. In short, there are options for quite a long time. But if we take the perspective already in billions of years, when it will become too hot even with the terraforming, uh, on average 50 degrees all over the planet, then relocation to other planets begins to become necessary. Fortunately, there are options where to move. However, before proceeding, it should be noted that uh, there is an unpleasant detail here. Uh, who said that uh, the solar system will be alright after so many years? The problem is that we can't predict it. The solar system is very stable and predictable at the moment, yes, but it won't last forever. And I'm not even talking about uh, changes in the sun. The fact is that time only leads to chaos, which is quite difficult to calculate. 
Therefore, there is such a thing as Lyapunov time, the time for which uh, the system is brought to chaos. In our case, the time after which it is impossible to say that everything will not uh, go to hell. For example, asteroids can affect the orbit of planets. We have two big guys, Ceres and Vesta, who can slightly change the orbit of Mars. But Ceres and Vesta are affected by the asteroid belt in which they spin. And yes, we have a whole asteroid belt located between Mars and Jupiter. In short, one insignificant layer affects the second significant layer, it affects the third very significant, etc. This can be calculated, but the problem is that it is extremely difficult to take into account each factor, and there are errors in calculations. As a result, looking into the future of Mars, for example in 10 million years, is practically meaningless. And here is the deal. We know that the solar system is very stable. But we also know that the orbits of our planets change uh, cyclically. There is such a thing as eccentricity, simply put, the elongation of the orbit. And the longer it is, the greater the difference between the maximum and minimum distance to the Sun. And for example, in the history of Mars, its orbit was both almost round and rather elongated. Now it's uh, something in between. The minimum distance to the Sun is uh, slightly rounding 200 million kilometers and the maximum is 250 million. But the elongation of the orbit of Mars is still cyclically increasing and then it will decrease. And just looking far into the future we cannot say to what limits this orbit can increase. Therefore, according to some calculations, in a conditional 5 billion years, due to the increase in the elongation of the orbit of Mars, it may intersect with the Earth. Will you guess what will happen or should I show you? And the same thing can happen with Mercury. Its orbit fluctuation is even greater. And there are even more options. The same critical crashing into the Earth or similarly Mercury may crash into Venus. Which is also super bad, because the fragments from this explosion will go through all the planets. So there may be a third option. Mercury will catch onto Venus, spin around it and uh, gaining speed will fly out of our solar system. Or maybe he will fall into the Sun altogether. All of this is fantasy of course, but that's the point. We know that the solar system can accept the parameters at which uh, all this will happen. And we cannot calculate whether the system will accept such parameters or not, because it is very far in the future. Ok, let's say none of this happened, and our planet is um, getting hotter because of the warming up of the Sun. Our next stop may be Mars. Although Mars is the easiest uh, to settle, there are still a lot of problems with it. Firstly, there is a very weak magnetic field, which should uh, protect us from solar radiation. Secondly, sandstorms can be a huge problem uh, for technology and energy production. Thirdly, it is quite cold there, on average minus 50-60 uh, degrees Celsius. Fourth, the atmosphere is very thin, 160 times smaller than ours. And fifth, uh, weak gravity, about 40% uh, of the Earth. However, more or less these things are solved by themselves after one or one and a half billion years. It's getting quite warm on Mars. Just when we need it, the Sun is getting hotter, Mars is warming up. And inside it, there is a lot of what we need – carbon dioxide and water. They are just inside the ground frozen. When defrosting, the water we need will melt in quite large quantities. There may be whole oceans inside the planet, although of course not in such volumes as on Earth. The depth of such oceans will be only about 10 meters, according to current estimates, but it will be all over the planet. Plus, dry ice will evaporate, that is carbon dioxide. The result may be some kind of atmosphere. Moreover, there is an assumption that 
at normal atmospheric pressure, all these uh, dust storms will settle down, minus another problem. That is, spacesuits will no longer be particularly needed. Since the pressure and temperature are normal, you will only need a mask with oxygen. And these conditions are already enough for plants. Plants give us oxygen and after a while you can even breathe. Unfortunately, problems with the radiation from the sun and low gravity remain. With low gravity, humans certainly evolve into something else. But uh, what can you do? Therefore, Mars is uh, likely to become the refuge of the next intelligent uh, civilization for quite a long time. It's going to be cool at first, yes, but it's getting warmer and warmer over the next 5 billion years. All this time it will be quite comfortable there. And I am extremely excited by this thought. The Sun is uh, 4.5 billion years old, but its lifetime is uh, 10, 11 billion. Life on Earth is 4 billion, there are still half uh, a billion, a billion left, in total about 5. And just when our time is over, Mars will be quite good for the remaining 5-6 billion years. Of course, with a lot of reservations, there is uh, still no magnetic field, it is not clear exactly what the atmosphere will be, etc. But still, the trend is like this, very intriguing when half the time of the Sun is good on Earth and half on Mars. Well, then time runs out for Mars too. Because the Sun is finally burning out its own and is already starting to grow powerfully. Here, on Mars and on the already scorched Earth, tidal capture can occur. This is when the speed of rotation around its axis is equal to the speed of rotation around a star or planet. Well, like the Earth and the Moon, it is always turned to us by the same side. The same can happen with Mars and Earth. Although, what difference does it make if everything has already burned down there? In theory, on the more distant satellites of the gas giants, it can get quite warm for a while on Titan or on Callisto, but unfortunately not for long, uh, because uh, here we need to find out what is going on with our Sun. Why is it uh, getting hotter? Why does it uh, increase in size and what details are dangerous for us? Because increasing the size is half the trouble. So I remind you, the Sun is a bunch of hydrogen with uh, small additives. At the point, this pile of hydrogen gathered uh, too close to each other and by the action of gravity merged together. Of course, the densest and heaviest was in the center of this mass. And where there are such heavy conditions, the temperature rises. At enormous pressure and temperature, two hydrogen atoms come so close to each other that they combine to form helium. This is so-called thermonuclear reaction, in which a huge amount of energy is released. That's why the Sun warms us. I think everyone already knows that, but then things uh, get a little more complicated. You will know about black holes that collapse under their own pressure. Actually, the core of the Sun is also shrinking very badly. But the energy that is released during the thermonuclear reaction also has its own pressure and presses the opposite outwards. There is such a delicate balance. Everything does not fall inwards because a counteracting force is formed from within. This is called hydrostatic equilibrium. And we will need it again, let's remember this moment. Now we need to understand that thermonuclear reactions take place only in the core. There is not enough pressure and temperature outside of it. Therefore, the resulting helium still remains in the core. He is heavier, so he stays there and he has nowhere to go under such pressure. Here he is lying around doing nothing. Here we can finally explain why the Sun is constantly getting brighter and hotter and we have to run away from it. Of course, greatly simplifying and uh, forgetting about uh, other reactions, but 
Look, we have an almost isolated core that resists compression due to the energy of the thermonuclear reaction of converting hydrogen into helium. But there is less and less hydrogen in the core. This means that the resistance force is less and less. And the outer layers have not gone anywhere and are still pressing. Accordingly, the pressure inside the core increases, which increases the reaction rate. Resistance returns to the previous level. Thus, the balance is preserved. That's why it's called balance. But the price for it is the increasingly rapid conversion of hydrogen into helium. And as a consequence, the continuing increase in temperature, which wants to roast us on Earth. Now you know why in a billion years life on our planet will be impossible. And then the hydrogen in the core completely ends. Only helium remains. There is no resistance. The core starts to shrink quite well. And what fills the volume that it left? The same hydrogen. A layer is formed around the compressed helium core, which receives sufficient pressure and temperature to continue the thermonuclear reaction. However, there is an important point here. This is a completely different square, but the strength of the counteraction is about the same as it was, and this newly distributed force begins to burst the sun from the inside, turning it into a red giant. Of course, this is again a highly simplified explanation of a process that is still not fully understood, but the essence is uh, something like this. Actually, this will happen to our Sun in 5-6 uh, billion years, and it starts to grow and turns red. It will be 256 times bigger than it's now. And I must say that the speed of what is happening is very relative. The Sun will reach its maximum size in a very long time, in 1 or 2 billion years. But according to an ever accelerating scenario, the actual graph is in front of your eyes. It's hard to say whether it's a lot or a little. On the one hand, uh, there is a lot. Again, if we teleport all of humanity to Mars at the beginning of this rapid expansion, then we will have time to develop technologies uh, 10 times and fly away. On the other hand, these are very rapidly changing conditions for life in general. And in the second half of this process, every year it will become much harder. So everything is um, ambiguous here. But nevertheless, I started all these explanations about the scheme of transformation of our sun into a red giant with a thought. Okay, when it gets too hot on Mars, we move to Callisto, to Titan, and here is our third, even more distant home. But this is most likely not going to happen for two reasons. Firstly, when the Sun reaches its maximum size, due to the increase in the energy released in the area, it will release about 30% of all matter in the form of solar wind. This means that it will have less gravity, which means that the orbits of all the planets will increase quite well, almost to 50%. What makes it very difficult to understand where and what will turn out to be, in which orbits uh, will they intersect, etc. Severe instability is already beginning. By the way, some scientists rely on this when calculating. Will the Sun swallow up the Earth or not? There is a small chance that the planet will have time to fly away, but it's unlikely. And secondly, even if the solar system remains stable with a lower gravitational force of our bloated giant, it won't last long, because it will try to light up again. The fact is that inside the core, helium still continues to shrink. The amount of helium increased from the thermonuclear reaction around it and the helium continued to heat up all this time until it reached the threshold when helium begins to connect with each other. 
Before that, the temperature and pressure were not enough. But now it's enough. The thermonuclear reaction starts again in the core. Only now helium is combined into carbon and oxygen. But, as you remember, if the core is working again, an opposing force appears again, which slightly expands the core. The shell surrounding the core is pushed outwards, which means the pressure in it drops. The thermonuclear reaction in it becomes less. It does not burst the outer layers of the sun, which means everything comes to a relative norm. So the sun is shrinking back. Not up to its original size, it will still be 10 times larger than ours, but it's better than 250 anyway. Unfortunately, this second breath will not last long only for 100 million years. There is no talk of any billions anymore. The reaction rate is very high and the material is much less. Therefore, in 100 million years, everything will happen again, but much faster. The sun will increase again to about the same orders, it is already quite difficult to say for sure. Someone says that it will get even bigger and this time it will definitely swallow up the earth if it couldn't uh, the first time. This is already guesswork. However, this second explanation definitely does not happen for long, only uh, for 20-30 million years. And in fact, this is a very dramatic stage. I won't get uh, into the details, but look, there are already quite a few layers inside the sun. A carbon core, then a layer of helium, then a layer of hydrogen that enters into a nuclear reaction, but in turn mixing in every possible way, etc. In short, because of this interaction and uh, the switching on and off of the thermonuclear reaction of hydrogen, the star seems to be uh, pulsating, getting a little bigger and brighter than vice versa, like a dying candle. Moreover, it's becoming more and more frequent and looks like uh, this on the chart. Due to the fact that I studied to be a medical doctor, I compare it to the heartbeat on an uh, ACG, which becomes more and more frequent and then breaks off. Is this literally some kind of poetry already? It all ends with nothing left to burn. There is no balance left inside, and the star has already released a bunch of hydrogen and helium outside. Therefore, it dumps the remnants of hydrogen and helium, forming a nebula, from which uh, then something will be assembled again. Moreover, all this will happen relatively calmly, no explosions and similar things. Well, in the middle, there will be a dense hot core of our sun, consisting of carbon and oxygen. It will be called a white dwarf. Although it is about the size of the Earth, it weighs about half of our original sun. So in theory, if we are very lucky, stability in our system will remain. The planets will not crash into each other and will continue to rotate in their orbits, just one and a half or two times further than it is now. And uh, since the white dwarf will shine about a thousand times weaker than our sun, all the remaining planets and satellites will be completely frozen and in absolute darkness. There will obviously be nothing to do here, without the main source of energy. Of course, the white dwarf is uh, still hot, but you have to be too close to it to get enough heat. However, it will cool down for a long time, perhaps not even billions, but quadrillions of years, turning into a black dwarf. However, that's another story, which we will return to very soon.